God, thank you so much for those truths that we get to sing, uh, biblical, scriptural words to go along with uh, what we desire to be our heartbeat, that we would look forward to a certain future, uh, the hope that we have of eternal life, long life with you in your kingdom under your good reign forever. God, we long to know that day when we will have purified lips, no more sin to speak of, no more sin to repent of, but glorified hearts and minds and bodies to fit us for perfect praise of your glorious name. God, even as we look toward that day and anticipate that time, we know that you've left us here with more to do uh, to glorify you before that day. And so I pray that the preaching of your word that the articulation of truth would be clear and would sanctify our hearts and help us to fixate on what you've spoken through your prophets. Use it to transform us more and more into the image of your son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. In our day there is almost no end to the number of fears that someone might experience. And we live in a time when you can get a name, a label put to just about any problem you might be experiencing in life. Uh, there's a, a one phobia called chronophobia. This is an irrational yet persistent fear of time and the passing of time. I hope none of you have been diagnosed with this. I mean, wouldn't you be afraid to be afraid of time passing? This is uh, in to psychiatrists labeled under a specific phobia which is an anxiety disorder characterized by a powerful, unwarranted fear of something that presents little or no actual danger, but instigates avoidance and anxiety. So it just doesn't make sense to be afraid of some things. And yet people who find themselves afraid of it, they can be labeled with this specific phobia. Chronophobia. This is also known, this chronophobia, as prison mania because people often experience this once they have been placed in prison and the length of the sentence begins to set in. Some of the symptoms of this prison mania are feelings of overwhelming fear, anxiety, and even panic, difficulty functioning normally because of this fear, a rapid heart rate, sweating, difficulty breathing. People become so consumed with these certain thoughts about this unwanted, intimidating upcoming event that they begin responding physically to their inability to be at peace in their own minds. At the level of their thinking, their mental life, they are unable to reconcile the truth of, for example, the prison sentence, the length of the prison sentence. And so they go into something of a psychotic episode, uh, a breakdown where their physical body is responding to their mental life in ways that are bizarre and unwanted. This, this phobia, chronophobia, of an imminent 
unexpected event can be really debilitating for those who experience these symptoms. Now, while we as believers should not accept the psychiatrist's opinion about this being the result of some physical illness, some illness in the brain, we should reject that notion. It still doesn't change the fact that these are real problems. It's real symptoms, real physical responses happening to real thoughts occurring in someone's heart. <clears throat> and in our text tonight, in Zephaniah chapter 1, we will read a description of the day of the Lord that is so severe to all those outside of Christ, the response should be what we see in those diagnosed with chronophobia. The description that we're going to read of the day of the Lord in Zephaniah chapter 1 verses 14 through 18 is so insufferably severe that anyone in their right mind outside of Christ should respond like someone with this kind of psychiatric diagnosis. Let me read our text. The prophet writes, Near is the great day of Yahweh. Near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of Yahweh. In it, the warrior cries out bitterly. Verse 15, a day of wrath is that day. A day of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and the high corner towers. I will bring distress on men so that they will walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord, Yahweh, and their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of Yahweh's wrath. And all the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy, for he will make a complete end, indeed a terrifying one of all the inhabitants of the earth. This is what God says to us in his word about this coming day. This passage lays out four signs of the insufferable severity of the day of the Lord. Four signs, four indications that this great day of the Lord is insufferably severe. That's what we have in our passage. The first of those signs is simply the proximity of the day. The proximity of the day. Verse 14 says, this day is near. It is a great day of Yahweh. It is near and coming very quickly. Here, Zephaniah has already told us initially what this day is going to be like. If you remember at the beginning of chapter one, after introducing himself with a rather lengthy genealogy, he goes on in verse two and following describing the universal destruction that's going to come on the world in this day. And then he zooms in in particular verse four to Judah Jerusalem, this day is not only coming upon the entire world, but specifically, this is coming because of Judah and for Judah. God's hand-chosen people who have persisted in sin, they are why this day is coming upon them, along with the rest of the world. Last week, we talked about the initial responses that are merited by this terrible day. Verse 7 calls for silence. Verse 11 
calls for sorrow. Silence and sorrow are the appropriate responses to this incredible description of this coming day. And now what Zephaniah is eager to do is rush into a more thorough description of this day, zooming back out, taking again a worldwide perspective, describing for all who would encounter this message, even those outside of Jerusalem and Judah, what they can anticipate on this day. And the first thing he describes is its proximity. It's proximity to the present in particular. He calls it near, and he calls it that twice. This is near, really near. Not only is it near, but it's also hastening. So as close as it is, it's hurrying to arrive, to get even closer. And just notice the words, the language that he's using to describe the severity or the significance of the day. He uses words that heighten the description, words like in verse 14, great, that great day. It's not only hastening or coming quickly, but it's coming how? Very quickly. This day is great. It is coming very quickly. And it is near already. This is caused some interpreters to just assume that this day has already happened. Some think otherwise, how could it be called near? But we do well to just remember that this is the word which came to Zephaniah uh, from Yahweh. It's the word of Yahweh which came to Zephaniah. And everything that's being articulated to the prophet is directly from God himself. So God is calling the day near. God has told Zephaniah to call this day near. That doesn't mean it has to be near from our perspective or from the original audience's perspective and on a human level. God is calling the day near. And just think about if you were in the original audience's sandals and you heard the prophet saying this and you heard that it was near, God is telling you, that this is near, anyone who would have believed the prophet would have taken him at his word. It's close, and it's in a hurry to arrive. I don't have any other reference point for how long that means. That could be a matter of hours. That could be a matter of days or weeks or months or years. Or like we find ourselves in, the position we find ourselves in is some 2,600 years after Zephaniah. From God's perspective, that forthcoming day is, when he said this, near. The God to whom a a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day, he can call this day that is still a future ways out from us, He can call it then near. So this in the audience, in the minds of the audience is adding to the the gravity of this day. It's close and it's coming quickly. The second sign of the insufferable severity of the day of the Lord is the sound of the day, the sound of the day. So not only the proximity But the sound, just look again at verse 14, a call to listen, a call to listen, the day of Yahweh, in it the warrior cries out bitterly. This, uh, not, not as obvious in the English text, but we've come across this word already. The word listen in verse 14 is the same word that we find in verse 10. That says there will be the sound of a cry from the fish gate. Coal in the Hebrew. So this sound or this uh, call to listen is really just a, 
Zephaniah is making us aware of the kinds of sounds happening on that day, and he calls for us to make note of the sounds. Hey, listen up. Here's what it's going to sound like on that day. And just to remind you, in verse 10, we've already come across some of these sounds. There is the sound of a cry or screaming from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash colliding from the hills. This is what it's going to sound like. Sounds of screaming, wailing, lamentation, and despair on that day. Because people are caught up in the ruin and the devastation of the day of the Lord. Have you ever heard uh, an animal dying before? You ever been in the vicinity when that's been happening? I, I, I know a woman who unfortunately witnessed her husband die and suffer from a, a, as a result of a severe heart attack. Without warning, he suffers this massive heart attack and she was there watching him struggle, gasp for breath in his dying moments, watch the paramedics get there, perform CPR on his lifeless body, trying to resuscitate him. And more haunting, according to her, than everything she saw was the sounds that she heard. Hearing her husband struggle for breath, gasp for air, gargle as he is choking, trying to survive. And she said, for the longest, that is what was the most haunting sensory experience of that whole moment. Think about this day. To hear countless souls perishing under the wrath of God, what would that be like? How would they die at the fish gate, this prominent place of the city where trade is happening? From the second quarter, from the hills, let me just remind you, the places where this devastation is occurring is affecting, as we saw, these prominent places in Jerusalem as well as the surrounding areas. That's a reference to the hills in verse 10. But the devastation is so comprehensive, so universal, that in verse 3, what's being affected? Man and beast, birds of the sky fish of the sea. This is everywhere in the air, in the sea, on the land. There's nowhere to go to escape the devastation. What would it be like to be privy to all of the noise at that time? Whatever the devastation is to hear the souls perishing this is what Zephaniah is trying to get us to think on to capture the sensory experience on that coming day for his audience. And so he calls in verse 14 for their attention. Listen, listen. The day of the Lord. There's a particular uh, sound, not only the the, the sound of those suffering, but the strength of the sufferers. Just note in verse 14, in this day, the warrior cries out bitterly. The warrior. These men who are privy to battle, the strongest of them all, the strongest men in every nation, crying like children. One commentator says it this way, this day will be so horrible 
that the mighty man, the warrior of many battles, accustomed to blood-curdling scenes and horrifying destruction, will shriek in abject terror at this unprecedented devastation. The warrior in that day cries out bitterly. He's never seen anything like this. He's never heard any sounds like this. He has never witnessed carnage on this level when Yahweh has his day. And so the proximity of the day and the sound of the day communicate that the severity of the day is absolutely intolerable to those who witness it. Thirdly, the attributes of this day are a sign of the insufferable severity. Notice in verse 15, how many times day is mentioned. A day of wrath is that day, a day of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and battle cry, against the fortified cities and the high corner towers. Seven times in these two brief verses, day, 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 this is that day. This is not just any day. This is the day, the one day. This again, just to reiterate this point, This is not a day that has happened in some form at various times throughout human history and will one day happen in its fullness. No, this is just one day in view, one period of time that Zephaniah is calling our attention to. And that just helps us as interpreters far past Zephaniah's initial communication to hone into the fact that this day is still coming. The attributes of this day describe the insufferable severity of it. This is a day of wrath. Just notice the descriptive words, wrath, trouble, distress, destruction, desolation, darkness, gloom, clouds, thick darkness, trumpet, battle cry. These are just, this is vivid, vivid language. Even in... The, the Hebrew, it's clear that Zephaniah is really exhausting his dictionary, searching for words to communicate something about the gravity of the language. Uh, it's interesting just looking up the, the definitions of these words, you really get a compounding of matching words that kind of mean the same thing. It's almost like he could have said a day of overflowing rage is that day, a day of distress and distress, a day of desolation and desolation, a day of pitch darkness and darkness, clouds and darkness. I mean, he's just struggling for the language to say, here it is. This is, this is severe. This is serious. And I'm running out of words to try and tell you how serious it is. You get the the picture that he's almost trying to frighten his audience away from the day into a fear of the Lord to escape the devastation of the day and experience the rescue that God has for those who fear him. We would do well to heed those words, to heed the warning to let those words have their proper effect on us. This is a day, first off, of wrath. That is God's wrath. It could be translated his overflowing rage. That's what the day's characterized by. It's all-consuming. People get swept up in this wrath of God on that day. It's a day of trouble and distress. (laughs) 
situations that people intentionally try and avoid. Unwanted circumstances. Circumstances that put people in a state of distress. That's what the day is. A day of destruction and desolation. Two words almost meaning the same thing. Uh, People, beasts, birds, fish, other creatures, and the rest of God's creation is being destroyed to the point that it could be called desolation, being the more intensified term there. So that when the destruction is done, you could look on it and say, this is the place is desolate. There's nothing left. This is also a day of darkness and gloom. Darkness and gloom. Again, two words virtually meaning the same thing. It's like pitch blackness and blackness. Now we do do well to just remember at this point, because as he's been describing from the very beginning, the undoing of creation, here's another point that emphasizes or just reiterates the same thing, creation, the undoing of creation. In chapter 1, verse 2, when he's bringing this complete devastation on the face of the earth, verse 3, we've talked about this already. The order in which he mentions these things, man and beast, birds of the sky, and fish of the sea. That's an intentional wording. He's, he's carefully choosing these words so that in the minds of his Torah familiar readers, his readers who are familiar with the law, they go, oh, that's Genesis 1, backwards. God first created fish, then birds, then beasts, then man. And so here he describes the undoing, the destruction of the same things in reverse order so that you get the picture creations being uncreated, undone. That's days six and five of creation. But by the time we get to our passage, verse 15, now it's dark. Now it's dark. What day is that? It's not day four. When you had the sun, the lights created by God to rule the day and night, he's not talking about the removal of heavenly bodies. He's talking about the removal of actual light. That's day one of creation. So here we started at the undoing of creation at day six. And by verse 15, we're all the way down to day one. Count them down. Six, five, four, three, two. Here we are, one. Creation is absolutely devastated. This is a day of clouds and thick darkness. Just think about what it would take, the, what kind of power would it take to create worldwide darkness? This is... Uh, Eclipse on a worldwide level, worldwide scale, everywhere, experiencing no light all at once. That's tremendous power. It takes creative power to control creation in that kind of way. Think back to the Exodus, right? In Egypt, the lights go out in Egypt, not in Goshen where Israel is. That's a communication of what God intended to Pharaoh and all of the Egyptians. I am Yahweh. You will fear me. You will know my name. The darkness, though, is ironically no hiding place for sinners. (laughs) The lights go out. And still, God is there pouring out his overflowing rage on those people in the dark. Let me just remind you of Psalm 139. Go to Psalm 139. This darkness is not a comfort to anyone seeking to escape the wrath of God. 
Why? David tells us in Psalm 139. Verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit, David says, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. That's a comfort for David who lives an upright life, that God is everywhere he could possibly go. Verse 11, if I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. And the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. When God brings about this universal darkness, nothing's hidden from him. The sinners on whom he intends to bring his Unique, specialized day of the Lord wrath still comes to those sinners when the lights go out. He is still there in all of his fury. Go to Job 34. We see another iteration of this same truth. Job 34. Job's one wise friend. In this moment, reminds his suffering and sinning friend Job of what kind of God he is charging with wrong. Elihu in Job 34, verse 21, says this of God For his eyes are upon the ways of a man, and he sees all his steps. There is no darkness or deep shadow where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. No gloom or deep darkness where evildoers may hide themselves. Where are you going to go? Away from God. Nowhere. On this day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, there is still nowhere to hide from God. Verse 16, this is also a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and the high corner towers. This reference to trumpet and battle cry, this is a reference to war. It's war language often found in contexts that describe the day of the Lord, this war language. This trumpet and battle cry are really God's battle cry his making war on man. But just notice that it comes against the fortified cities, the safest places to be, the high corner towers, the most safest places in a city that are fortified, well-prepared for any encroaching enemy. Still, God makes war on those places even. This is no safe place away from the Lord is the point on this day. Anybody hearing this severe description of the day, the only wise response at this point is to ask, what must I do to be saved from this day? How can I avoid this wrath that's coming? But what it would take to ask that question is a believing heart. It would take a believing heart to hear the God's words from God's prophet and say, what must I do to be saved? Any scoffer on this day, they're unconcerned because they're too busy in their folly scoffing at the words of the prophet. They don't believe him. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Or maybe later, I'll obey those words. 
We have a great example of this in Proverbs 1. Let me just show you another, another passage that describes that kind of response to God's wise words. Where God calls for change, those who hate knowledge and love folly disregard God's wisdom. Like some in Zephaniah's day. Like some in our day. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 20. And just note the similarity of context. uh, The similarity of, of ideas in the context between Proverbs 1 and Zephaniah 1. Here's what Solomon notes in in verse 20. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the markets, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. Because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity and will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. You notice the similarity of descriptive words, that attributive language to the day, trouble, distress, calamity, anguish. Why did, why did they call out for wisdom finally and couldn't find it? Because, verse 29, they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of Yahweh. They would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have the fill, their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. You see how there's a, an escape, an ability to rest at ease if God's wisdom is heeded when it calls out? Otherwise, there is a suddenness of destruction that is coming upon sinners, those who reject God's wisdom. And when that terror comes, there will be no escape. The fourth sign of the insufferable severity of the day of the Lord is finally, number four, the Lord of the day. The proximity of the day, the sound of the day, the attributes of the day, and the Lord of the day are all signs of its insufferable severity. And this here, we really get to the peak of the signs of insufferable severity. It's God himself. This is, after all, the day of the Lord. It is Yahweh's day. And just notice all that he is doing in verses 17 and 18. I will bring distress on men so that they walk like the blind because they have sinned against Yahweh. And their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of Yahweh's wrath. And all the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy. For he will make a complete end, indeed a terrifying one of all the inhabitants of the earth. The language here doesn't leave room for much passivity on God's part. The language is very active. It is God who is accomplishing these things. Just notice in verse 17, I will bring distress on men. For God, this is personal. 
It is personal. And why is this personal? He tells us in verse 17, because they have sinned against me. That's the only reason he needs sin. So here on this day, he personally brings the distress. The distress does not just happen because of some natural phenomena outside of God's control and without God's help. No, God is sovereignly guiding all of human history to this day, or better yet, the day to human history, to its fruition in time and space. This day is coming by God's sovereign ordination. And he is bringing this distress on sinful men to bring about this effect. He is causing them to walk like the blind. Even that language is hearkening back to Deuteronomy 28, 28, when he says that if his people do not obey him, this is going to be the effect. In the middle of the day, they will be groping around like blind men. In context, why would they be doing that in the middle of the day? Well, because he's brought about a supernatural darkness. It's judgment. And so he is bringing the distress. The Lord is. He is causing the staggering. The Lord is. He is demonstrating that he hates sin. All of this is for this one reason, because they have sinned against Yahweh. This is why the day is coming because of sin. Give you one more reference. Turn over to Colossians chapter three. I want to help us to just see how comprehensive this theme is across scripture. Paul tells the Colossian believers, the saints and faithful brothers in Colossae, he calls them, to chapter 3 of Colossians, verse 5, put to death the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Why? Why? For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them, you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. He can call the Colossian believers who have been rescued from the wrath of God that's coming to now continually in an ongoing active way, keep putting these things away from you. Why? Because those are the very things, those are the very sins for which the wrath of God is coming. So they can't characterize you. You've been rescued from the wrath of God. You won't experience the coming wrath of God. You've been saved from the day of the Lord. And so don't live like, people for whom the day of the Lord is coming. Do you see the Christian ought not be characterized by those sins that are bringing the wrath of God. The sins that men commit against Yahweh should not characterize us as believers. And just think about how that becomes motivation for you, Christian, to put away sin. One of Two things is true. Either you are putting to death the deeds of the flesh by the spirit, by faith, and your life is increasingly looking not like the people in the world for whom the wrath of God is coming. That's one option because the wrath of God is not coming for holy people or your life is Perpetually being characterized by those same sins for which God will avenge himself against sinners. And if your life looks like the unbelievers for whom the wrath of God is coming, 
then you should not comfort yourself that you will escape the wrath of God. That's the connection between faith and the fruit of faith. I know I have faith and have been rescued from the wrath of God by grace through faith alone. If the fruit that comes from that faith are being born in my life. So these very things that Paul is calling the Colossians to put away, he can call them to put away and trust that they will be if these are indeed faithful brothers. So press on in holiness, strive for holiness, not to save yourself from God's wrath, but to prove that the faith that God has already gifted you with by his own grace has saved you from the wrath of God. Do you understand? Press on for holiness in increasing measure. This insufferable severity signified by the Lord of the day who brings distress, causes staggering, hates sin, and annihilates sinners. He is not holding back. This is perfectly self-controlled, but incredible rage. Just look at what he does at the end of verse 17 to these men. Their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Like a, something detestable and worthless in large quantities. <laughs> This is how blood is poured out on the earth. Verse 18, this God also impartially judges because verse 18 says, neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of Yahweh's wrath. Neither their silver nor their gold. God is unbribable. Silver won't help you. Gold won't help you. Your wealth will not protect you from the wrath of God. He is an impartial judge. Remember Proverbs 11, verse 4, that we mentioned last week, where Solomon says in Proverbs 11, 4, riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Here again, we have the same truth articulated. Riches do not profit on that day. Why? All the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy. God consumes absolutely everything. He will make a complete end. He will destroy everything, even a terrifying end of all the inhabitants on the earth. This day is coming. Do you believe that? This is not hell. This is not a description of the afterlife where God forces people, casts people to use Jesus language into hell. This is hell on earth, if you will. You don't want to be here on that day. This is, should just cause us, this passage, as we just wrestle with the, the language and the thorough description of that day, this should just make us stand in awe of God, a God powerful enough to make this day come about, a God just enough to punish sinners in this severe way, a God faithful enough to not waver on his promise to bring it about, and a God gracious enough to rescue men and women from the day. Just, just as, a, as an application, as an implication from the scripture, just stand in awe of God and say, wow, what a God this is. That just, that faithful, that gracious, that angry and righteously indignant towards sin. Psalm 711, God is a righteous judge who feels indignation every day with sinners.
And as you stand in awe of God, then worship him. Worship him. Stand in awe of God and positively ascribe greatness and worth to him. Live in such a way that you willingly submit absolutely any and everything you have to offer to be at his disposal, to use as he will. Your mind, offer it to him as an act of worship. Your thought life, offer it to him as an act of worship. Your desires, your motivations, your choices, your will, offer those things. We must give those things to him to be used as he will. If we believe these words, then that is the right response. One final implication to draw from this passage. Um, Zephaniah will get there. We will get there next week. Here's how he says it in chapter two. Here's where this goes. After he's just, you know, he, he catches his breath finally. And begins to turn the corner. And here is his call. Gather yourselves. Seek the Lord. That's what we should do. That is a sign of humility, a sign of a believing heart, eager to turn to God in worship. Seek the Lord. Don't live like a practical atheist here on Sunday, comforted by sitting under hopefully decent preaching, uh, sitting under sound teaching, Good shepherding, Lord willing. Good fellowship, Lord willing. And that is the extent of your relationship with the Lord, the community and company I keep at Grace Bible Church. No, you must be a sincere worshiper, seeker of the Lord. It is for God not being sought after, according to verse 6, that this day is coming. People who don't seek him, don't inquire of him. Just think about how this ties into your Bible reading. Do you seek the Lord on your own? Do you desire him apart from being fed from the public proclamation of his word and preaching and teaching that you might get on a Sunday in small group in other contexts? Do you seek him on your own? When you find yourself wrestling with temptations, do you retreat to his word for refuge? That's a sign of sincerity. And the New Testament way of, of saying, I think what Zephaniah is getting at, again, I'll just read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says in chapter five of first Thessalonians verse nine, for God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Have you fled to Christ for safety as refuge from this coming day? Have you retreated to him like he is your only hope to be saved from the wrath of God that's coming? Repent, believe the gospel. If you have not, if you have lived a duplicitous life, then stop saying you believe the gospel. And finally, for the first time, repent and entrust your soul to Christ who rescues from the wrath to come. And then those of us who have done this, go tell everybody this same good news. What I want to do here is just, this is, bears a a kind of weight that I just want us to spend a few minutes on your own in prayer 
and just consider these things? Just before the Lord, whatever appropriate response this text warrants, whatever appropriate meditation a text like this might warrant from you, just take a few minutes to to pray and and seek the Lord, and then I'm going to just be back and I'll pray for us together. God, these uh, words are sobering. These words are good for us where we experience uh, overall very little persecution, very little resistance from the outside to our faith. to be reminded by these old, old words, but so relevant of this coming day. God, make us live like these words are true. Help us to feel the weight of them, not only for our own souls, but those around us, people we pass on the street, people we drive by people we encounter at the gas station and in restaurants, in schools, in grocery stores, that we are surrounded by people who will cry out bitterly because of this day. Should you come and take your church now and leave a world of sinners to experience your judgment. Give us a heart of compassion that we would think soberly and sensibly about the nearness of this day and that we would be a people at Grace Bible Church that is such that the whole world would know we believe this message. Even if they refuse to, that it would be clear to them we believe this is true. And we would rather be viewed as crazy in our attempts to be compassionate than to be reserved and fear man. God, let this word have its proper effect on us in all the ways that it ought to. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.